starting. And now the judges can introduce themselves. Hi, good afternoon, Oregon, and congratulations on making it to the national finals. That's a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, my name is Ben Glickman. I'm an attorney with the California Attorney General's Office. I'm also an alumnus of this program. Uh, I participated in the national finals for California way back in 1995. Uh, so I've been on that side of the proverbial table. Um, it's going to be fun. Uh, relax. If you uh, get stumped, just hold real still and we'll think your Zoom froze. Um, <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll get going here after my other colleagues introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Ali Khan. I am an attorney in Chicago. Uh, and like Ben, an alum of the program, uh, I participated in nationals uh, for Illinois uh, back in 90, 1998. And uh, congrats on being here. I know it takes a lot of time and effort. So uh, I, I speak for my fellow judges that we're excited to talk to you today. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan Taubman. I'm a senior judge on the Colorado Court of Appeals in Denver, Colorado. Uh, unlike uh, Ben and Ollie, I'm not an alumnus of the program, but I've worked with We The People for many years, and uh, I look forward to hearing your presentation. Please introduce yourselves and your teacher. Hello, we are Unit 3 from Grant High School in Portland, Oregon. My name is Quinn Bennett. My name is Ty Halpern. My name is Maya Rashid. And my name is Natalie Kolrak, and this is our teacher, Ms. D. Pasquale. Great, thank you. Uh, so we'll go ahead and read the question. It should be no surprise. Um, number two, there is nothing I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and in opposition to each other. What issues led to the formation of the original political parties? To what extent have those issues persisted in American political parties? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of a unified or divided government? Whenever you're ready. Serving as President Washington's Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton created ambitious financial programs, including a national bank, high tariffs, and a national assumption of each state's debts. He believed in a strong federal government, creating an economy that could compete globally. He believed in expansive federal power stemming from broad interpretations of Article I, Section 8. Those who agreed became the emerging Federalist Party. These ideas angered Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, leading him and then Representative James Madison to create the opposition Jeffersonian Republican Party. They believed that the government shouldn't interfere with individual economic freedom. The Jeffersonian Republicans believed in strong state power and a literal interpretation of the Constitution. They believed that if an act of Congress exceeded its constitutional authority, states had a duty to declare it void. This was exemplified with the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions passed in response to the Federalist Alien and Sedition Acts. Washington signed the Federalist-supported Jay Treaty in 1794, which established trade with Britain. This angered isolationist Republicans who saw the treaty as establishing a global American presence. The Jeffersonian Republicans, trying to appear populist, sided with the French during the French Revolution, whereas the Federalists sided with the British and other monarchies. Many of the original issues have persisted, like the pull between a strong or weak federal government. The Lincoln Republicans campaigned on the idea of a strong national government during the Civil War. Conversely, Republican President Reagan argued government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. We still see arguments over globalism versus isolationism in disputes over international trade deals. Democrats favor globalism, demonstrated by President Obama's push to pass the Trans-Pacific Partnership, while current Republicans, again trying to appear populist, favor isolationism. This was seen with President Trump's withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership and renegotiation of NAFTA. Theories of constitutional interpretation have also persisted. Republicans in the founding era held a strict view of the Constitution, as do conservatives today. This is reflected in the Supreme Court as the more conservative judges argue for an originalist interpretation of the Constitution, whereas more liberal judges argue for a broad interpretation. 
In a unified government, one party controls both the executive and the legislature. This has the advantage of promoting efficiency and more legislation. This is exemplified in President Biden's stimulus relief bill, which gave aid to millions of Americans. Unified government can be a disadvantage because the legislature does not check the executive. The United States currently has a unified government with Democrats controlling Congress and the presidency. Parliamentary systems like the United Kingdom always have one party in control. A benefit of parliamentary government is that the prime minister is always the legislator. Divided government refers to split control of presidential government. This occurred in the United States government between 2018 and 2020 with Democrats controlling the House and Republicans controlling the Senate and presidency. Divided governments can lead to gridlock. Both the 112th and 116th Congress had low productivity and consequently low approval ratings due to split control. Divided governments can also be an advantage, preventing power grabs or major upheavals to the system of government. As historian Richard Hofstadter argues, opposition parties are essential to a representative democracy. Thank you. We are ready for your questions. Great, thank you. So, so one of the consequences of our two-party system is that third parties have never really been able to get much traction. Is, is that a problem? And if it is, are there structural changes you could propose that, that might allow third parties a better shot? I would argue it's not a problem. I think it's better to have two parties because it gives voters a clear choice before principles and it simplifies voting and choosing representatives and senators and presidents. I would agree with that sentiment. It also makes it easier for people to hold their representatives in Congress more accountable. Uh, if everyone is kind of acting out of their own political interest and there's no real parties, then it's very hard to identify the one cog in the machine that's holding up the system. With two major parties, it's very easy to vote one group out of power if you are displeased with how they're ruling the government. However, if you wanted to adopt a system that would allow for third parties, one thing that we could do is adopt proportional representation. And this is where districts have multiple members and then they're allotted based on the percentage that each party gets in the voting, opposed to our first past the post voting system where the it's a winner takes all type of system. However, going back on my colleague's um, point, a reason that we don't have many third parties is because of the electoral college and the electoral college makes it so that third parties are unable to emerge um, because of the need to win 270 uh, electoral points. Without the electoral college, um, there would be a higher chance of third parties gaining traction. However, because of the electoral college and it not be seeming like it will be abolished in the near future, this doesn't seem like it will be a feasible act. Let's pick up there. Would you support, would you support abolishing the electoral college? Why or why not? I would because it makes voting um, votes count very different depending on what state you live in. For example, a vote in Wyoming has 3.6 times more influence than a vote in California. Additionally, um, because of the fact that if we didn't win the Electoral College, um, it would go to the House, which is extremely counter majoritarian and because each state would only get one vote. Yeah, this is counter majoritarian because as we know, you know, states like California have nearly 40 million people, where states like Wyoming have only about half a million. Additionally, the form, like the reason the Electoral College was created and the reason founding fathers like Madison and Hamilton support the Electoral College is because they didn't trust the people to elect the president directly, and they only trusted them to, to elect indirectly. And I think we have a more comprehensive view of democracy now. Democracy is not a bad word to us in the modern era, however it was to them. Um, you said that you thought that um, third parties aren't, would not necessarily be helpful because it makes things simpler to have on, only uh, two parties. Um, but um, in, in that regard, why do you think that there are more and more people who are not affiliating with either party? Statistics have shown in recent years that that's that to be the case. There is hyper, sorry, Natalie, you can go. 
I think a big thing is in the 60s, um, with uh, de that started in the 1960s, we have a decrease in party discipline and party unity and party loyalty. Um, and these could have been created by getting rid of the spoil system where parties helped people get jobs in Washington or having the people choose uh, the primary candidates and having state run primaries instead of uh, party leaders choosing the candidates. Yeah, I would also say that it is, uh, I guess, it's because Congress is not being very productive and efficient. If we look at our most recent Congresses, they've been very unpopular because they've also been the most gridlocked. Uh, for example, the 112th Congress was one of the most unpopular Congresses of all time. And so I believe that because things aren't getting done, people are looking for alternatives. So you, you mentioned multi-member districts as 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 one option for uh, increasing the, the number of parties, perhaps. Ranked choice voting is an, another related concept that often comes up. Can you tell me what that is and what the pros and cons would be if we were to adopt ranked choice voting? So ranked choice voting is when everybody lists um, each candidate uh, in order of, uh, like they, they rank each candidate. And if your first choice vote um, candidate doesn't receive a majority, then your vote goes to your next choice and then your next one and so on until the candidate has a majority. And a pro of this system is that people can vote for third party candidates without feeling like they're gonna throw their vote away. Yeah, we've seen this actually work to foster, I guess, more candidates and more parties uh, with places like New York City who are using ranked choice voting for their uh, mayor race. Uh, for example, New York has multiple parties more than just the major two, like the Working Families Party. And um, in places like Maine and Vermont, where ranked choice voting is used, um, we see a rise in other candidates, such as Bernie Sanders from Vermont as an independent. Um, do you think that perhaps our country could be uh, less partisan, less gridlocked if we mandated that the uh, president and vice president had to come from different political parties? I would say no, because in actuality, what we've seen throughout history from presidencies like uh, President Lincoln's presidency with his vice president being Andrew Johnson from the Democratic Party while he was a Republican, uh, it did not really foster a lot of bipartisanship. It really just uh, created an internal struggle within the president's cabinet that eventually led to uh, one of America's most unpopular presidents once President Lincoln died, that being Andrew Johnson. So I would say looking at history, um, it hasn't worked, so I don't think it would work in the future. Yeah, but the way that we could actually foster bipartisanship is readopting earmarks where um, leg senators uh, and Congress people can allocate money to go to um, you know, specific districts to gain more bipartisan support. And the reason why we got rid of earmarks is because there were a lot of controversy around them, one of which including $223 million going to a bridge to nowhere in Alaska. So if we were to readopt them, transparency would be extremely important. Additionally, additionally, because of the hyperpartisanship in the current Congress and in the in today's current political climate, having having two different political members in the same branch of government that are on opposite sides really would just foster more hostility towards the other. Because if something didn't get done in the executive branch, that would always get placed on the opposition party. On the other hand, having two people in the executive branch could allow both parties to see themselves being represented in the executive government, and it could foster compromise or finding common ground be between the two parties. And if the executive branch was successful, both parties would feel like they achieved something. <laughs> hey, we're all out of time. Um, let's give a big round of applause for the students to congratulate them for all their hard work. And now the judges have some feedback for you. I forgot, I, it's me, I'm first. Uh, <laughs> nice job. Uh, yeah, so I thought you guys did a great job. I thought the, the prepared remarks, uh, you know, really covered, 
covered the ground for the, of the question. There was a few things we hadn't heard so far today that the J treaty getting in there. Um, and I, you really hit on the, the globalization versus the isolationism, both in the founding era and how that's continued to, to today with TPP and, and NAFTA and, and the like. So I thought that was great. Um, and I thought you guys did a really nice job on the, the, oh, the other thing we haven't heard today is how the different views of how the constitution should be interpreted or applied have, have persisted throughout history. I think that's an interesting uh, interesting uh, window into that, that question too. And then I thought you guys did a very nice job on the unified versus uh, divided and the pros and cons there. So I don't have any real quibbles with your uh, prepared remarks. I thought it, it did a nice job. On the question and answers, again, you were very responsive. You had good examples and, and supporting evidence for the most part where, where appropriate. Um, on my question about ranked choice voting, I appreciated that you, you've you had some examples and were able to point to how, you know, in, it's in actually, in fact, increased uh, the, the minor party candidates in places that have used it. Um, you didn't really address any cons of ranked choice voting, which was part of the question. Uh, and, and maybe that's because you don't think there are any, um, but but next time say that. So I, I know you, you are addressing that part of the question, but that's that's really a nitpick. Uh, you know, I thought you guys, you know, it was a, you know, you're very well spoken and, and, and have clearly done a lot of work. So you should be very proud of yourselves. Um, again, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations again for being here. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to you and talking with you. Um, you know, I, I echo everything, you know, Ben just said. Um, I really like some of your, uh, you know, evidence. I like the stat on the, uh, I have it right, that a, a vote in Wyoming is 3.6 more impactful than one in uh, California. Did I get that right, I think? Okay. Um, I like your theory about we can increase bipartisanship by bringing back earmarks. I haven't heard that today. That was a, a new one. Um, other than that, you know, you guys all participated. Uh, you felt free to disagree, you were enthusiastic. I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, wish you the best of luck. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation as well. Um, I liked your uh, discussion about the differences between Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, and in particular your views about uh, how they, they had different views about um, supporting France and Great Britain. Uh, Thomas Jefferson actually accused um, <clears throat> Uh, Hamilton of being a monarchist because he supported Great Britain. Uh, and uh, the Democratic Republicans, on the other hand, because of the French Revolution, supported um, the, uh, France. And they thought they were being more uh, in line with the common people, even notwithstanding the excesses of the French Revolution. So I was glad to see you, you mentioned that. Um, I was glad to see your analogy to the parliamentary procedure and talking about uh, unified government and how that contrasts with uh, the kind of uh, government we have. Um, then, um, and I like your answer when uh, I uh, asked why fewer people are, are affiliated with the parties and you mentioned that in the 1960s, there is a decrease in party discipline uh, an end of the spoil system. And that's something we haven't heard uh, before today. So I, I thought that was a good point. Um, when you were asked about the, having a president and a vice president of different parties, I thought it was really good that you mentioned that Lincoln and Johnson were different parties. You might have mentioned that the 12th amendment actually provided for having the president and vice president or before the 12th amendment rather, there was a provision for the president and vice president coming from different parties, and that was ended by the 12th Amendment. Uh, but that's a relatively minor point. Uh, so overall, I think you did a really nice job in, in covering uh, all of the aspects of the question. So you should feel very good about your presentation this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great job.